Thank you, Brock. First, I do want to thank Brock and Kara for convening this webinar series and inviting the Resilience Thematic Group to make a contribution. We're pretty excited about the global reach and quality of this series. So thank you again for inviting us to join. Yes, again, my name is Dorian Fougere. I'm the Vice Chair, along with Mike Jones of the Resilience Thematic Group. We work a lot on these concepts around social ecological systems and resilience, adaptation, transformation, equity and justice. In fact, we just released a discussion paper around transformative conservation back in April, which is available on the IUCN portal. Again, my name is Dorian Fougere. By day, my day job, I'm the Acting Deputy Director for the State of California Tahoe Conservancy, and by night, help with the Resilience Thematic Group. So let me just give you a bit of orientation to today's presentation. Here's a simple outline, really four parts. The first part just orients you a little bit to Lake Tahoe and gives you some foundational background. The second part is a deep dive. It's the longest part. It's around the Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership, which is the foundation for the third part, which is the main focus of the title, the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative. And then the fourth part is a bit of a look ahead to some of the changes we're seeing starting to occur in the Lake Tahoe Basin and some of these transformations on the horizon. So with the first part, some of you may have visited Lake Tahoe. It's the largest alpine lake in North America, about 25 miles long, north to south. It's about 35 kilometers, quite deep as well, 1,600 feet deep or about 500 meters deep. And it's famous, some of you may have seen the signs or stickers around Keep Tahoe Blue. It's famous for its deep clarity, how deeply you can see into the water. That has been in steady decline since the 1970s, but it's a whole nother story, so I'm not gonna go into that issue today. But again, Lake Tahoe being famous for its clarity. In terms of its geography, you can't see the state lines here on this map, but it actually straddles the state of California and the state of Nevada. And if you look at the right-hand map that shows public ownership in the Lake Tahoe Basin, there are about 200,000 acres or 80,000 hectares of land in the Lake Tahoe Basin. The vast majority, about 75% of that, is owned by the Federal Forest Service. Another 8% or so are state lands from the state of California. We have California State Parks and my agency, the California Tahoe Conservancy. And on the Nevada side, about 13% are in state ownership. The remaining 4% in the basin are private and municipal ownership. Some key background most relevant to this presentation is the fire history in the Lake Tahoe Basin. Particularly what got things started or kind of rejuvenated was the Angora Fire in 2007. It burned around 3,000 acres on the south shore of Lake Tahoe, destroying about 280 properties and creating about $140 million in property damages. This was a big wake up call. A lot of the fire districts had been doing great work on their own, but this idea of really partnering across jurisdictional boundaries and with the Forest Service and other landowners became very prominent after that event. So a little bit of a precursor, if you look on the right hand side, that's the 2014 King Fire on the neighboring El Dorado National Forest to the southwest. That covered about 97,000 acres. Really alarming here in the basin. It didn't come into the basin, luckily, but was basically on the edge. You can see in that photo some of the smoke plumes, and you see towards the bottom the little horizons of the mountain tops there, so you can get a sense of the scale of what was just on the horizon. Both these events created a big impetus or desire for landscape, forest landscape restoration. That's part of a national trend in the United States over the past 15, 20 years, becoming more prominent each year. In 2010, the federal government established the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program within the US Forest Service. That was looked to as a model, and I'll talk about that a bit more in some of the pieces that come. That was looked to as a model for what could be done here in Lake Tahoe. On the right hand side, you see a more recent map from 2018 just showing the range of these forest collaboratives that are now popular in California, all the way from the Oregon border, all the way into Southern California. So this is really a trend throughout the state of California and the American West. We are in the Pacific Southwest region of the Forest Service, by the way. So it's a bit of fundamental background. I'm now gonna go on and start orienting to you to the Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership. This actually spun up in 2016, got started in 2016. 
the goal here, it's critical for this webinar series, it was not to restore historical conditions. It was to restore the resilience of this landscape through the ecological processes that shape and maintain the landscape over time. In particular, in the Sierra Nevada, this is fire. These are fire adapted forests. So a lot of focus throughout this effort on restoring fire as an ecological process. Just so I don't skip over things too fast, what do we mean by resilience? Here we're talking about the, some of the classic definitions. It's the capacity to withstand a disturbance and respond to that disturbance while still maintaining the structure, the processes, the functions, the identity of that particular system and to learn through that experience and to adapt through that experience. It's important to really call out that adaptation is a part of resilience. It's not something separate, it's part of the concept of resilience. So down on the left-hand side, you can see the logos of the different agencies that convened the Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership. There are five public agencies, federal, regional, and state agencies, as well as the National Forest Foundation, our key nonprofit partner. There also is about a 14-member science team from various institutions and two different stakeholder committees, one really focused on technical aspects, the other focused on community engagement and community concerns. This next slide is critical. It really underwrites almost the whole, whole of this webinar presentation, goes a bit to the process design of how we thought about the partnership. And what I'm showing here is the forest landscape management cycle. A key part on that, you'll see it all around the perimeter and also in the center is this idea of capacity, capacity of people, capacity of institutions. That can be training and personnel and workforce, it can be equipment and buildings and technologies, it can be the contracting vehicles that you use to get the work done, the partnerships, all these components of capacity. Those feed into the steps one through seven in the inner ring of the diagram here. And you'll see we start off with a landscape assessment, really assessing the conditions on the entire geography of interest. The second part is developing a landscape restoration strategy or landscape strategy. We'll deep dive into that in a few minutes. That is looking at how you would restore the landscape as a whole with values like connectivity and uh, adjacency, other values that really stretch and span the whole landscape. The third part is project planning, where you're gonna go and do your individual projects, whatever scale that might be. Fourth one is permitting. Fifth one is implementation. The sixth one is critical in terms of economies using those restoration byproducts, whether that's timber or small diameter trees that are coming off from restoration work. And number seven starts getting us back in the loop, really the monitoring that feeds into adaptive management, learning, experimentation, and keeps us going in that circle, really trying to get better about how we manage that entire landscape. Last key point on this is what this lends itself to is a pipeline approach. So instead of planning a project one year, you implement the next year, you try and get another plan, project planned, you go to implementation, you're kind of always going back and forth, bouncing between planning and implementation. The idea here is plan for your entire geography of interest, do that assessment, do that strategization, 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 Oh, let me not go there, but strategization, and then you go on and actually can do a whole series of uninterrupted projects over a period of 10 years or so. So you have some stability and certainty in terms of your planning, but also in terms of your partner industry that's related to that. Again, those small diameter restoration products, or in some cases, timber that are coming off land. So really getting a bit more of that certainty going forward, that pipeline of projects, rather than single project, single implementation, single project, simple single implementation. Another key piece just to kind of convey some of the process design here, it starts really with a systems approach. I should pause there and say what I mean by that. We're talking about complex systems that have some adaptive capacity, some ability to learn and to grow like we talked about. So systems in the literature, if you look at it, have stocks, they have flows, they have feedbacks. What's so important about systems compared to maybe something that's engineered is the nonlinear aspects of it. It's dynamic, there's a lot of agency, there are emergent properties, there's a capacity for self-organization within that system, and again, adaptation. So that's some of the cardinal underpinnings or concepts of all of this work. What that means in the Lake Tahoe Basin is we also try and not pull apart people from nature or people from the landscape. We joke that you actually find people on wildlife cameras for Martin and other animals. There are people everywhere in the Lake Tahoe Basin. They love getting out within nature. 
What that means for our project, practically, if you look on the left-hand side, typically we have this patchwork, multi-jurisdictional lands, individual projects here and there. You do something for watershed here, fish here, forest here. What we're trying to do is shift towards that right-hand side where you're putting forest restoration together with watershed restoration together with community values like cultural landscapes or recreation in the same project. And you're of course doing this across jurisdictions, federal, state, local jurisdictions, private jurisdictions, and private property. What you can get to with that approach is these great efficiencies within planning. You're doing one planning process. You can do it in funding where you have coordinated funding applications and you can do it in terms of operations. For example, if you're doing a prescribed burn, you don't have to mobilize your crew to stop that burn at the boundary of the property. You can burn across with your partner and get that efficiency in operations. Another critical piece here, oops, my slide's not advancing. Another critical piece here, as you can see from this image on the left-hand side, you have our traditional project planning approach, typically a 3,000 acre project, 2,500 acre project, somewhere around there, fairly small, one or 2,000, 3,000 acres. And you have a whole series of them. You can see them on the West Shore that's shown here, a variety of different projects. What we're moving towards is on that right-hand side, you can see the landscape approach. So instead of individual projects, you have one large project, one landscape that we're going for. It's up from Tahoe City in the north, all the way south covering Emerald Bay for anyone that's visited Lake Tahoe, that really iconic part of the basin. So it's all jurisdictions, all lands within that particular landscape. What's so important about this shift is we're trying to match the scale of our management to the scale of those ecological processes that shape and maintain the landscape that I mentioned earlier, like fire in this case. The reason that's so important is we need to increase the pace and scale of our management work to keep pace with some of the disturbances and changes that are being amplified by climate change, even without climate change, just to continue to have healthy forests where people can live and thrive and be safe. If we don't do that, if you do these individual projects, it's probably 60 to 100 years by the time you're going to treat all that land on the West Shore instead of what historically was maybe 10 years, 12 years, 15 years for fire to go through that system and touch every part of that landscape. So it's really about matching the scale of our management to the scale of the ecological processes. Next slide gets into really some of the nitty gritty of the process. The first thing we started out from that cycle, if you remember, is the landscape resilience assessment. I certainly don't expect you to be able to read this small text or to give you an eye exam, but this was the beginning of our framework of trying to assess resilience in a rigorous way. So you can see here on this next slide, what I wanted to call out is some of these cardinal questions you have to work through if you're gonna do a resilience assessment. What do you want to be resilient? In this case, again, it's these ecosystems, the meadows, the aquatic systems, but also the communities, public health and safety, cultural landscapes, et cetera. And then you have to ask yourself, what do we want these systems to be resilient to? In this case, it's a series of disturbances. There's fire, there's smoke, there's erosion, there's insects and disease, there's human activity itself. All these things being amplified by climate change. So that's what we want our systems to be resilient to. And then you have to ask yourself for whom? Who is the beneficiary? Whose values are you building into this process? In this case, it's a lot of residents that live on the West Shore. It's businesses. It's the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. And it's people that recreate throughout these public lands. So that's a bit of the orientation for how we even build the framework. Couple things to mention here, what was so exciting, we were able to do a quantitative assessment of that entire landscape, not purely a qualitative piece. They both fit together, but in this case, we had quote unquote wall to wall or comprehensive data. That's LIDAR data, it stands for light detection and ranging. It's information that's obtained from a plane. And so that kind of data was really critical. It lets us really identify all parts of the landscape. What was then difficult and a bit of a mental shift for a lot of the partners that were involved in this was how, do, how then do we determine what is a meaningful indicator of resilience? It's a bit different than just something saying, hey, water quality, good or bad, or forest uh, seral stage diversity, diverse or not. We're trying to think about what tells us about resilience, what tells us about that ability to respond and withstand disturbance in particular. So it was a bit of a shift in how people were processing this. That was a big part of the deliberative process. And then another filter was, okay, even though you have LIDAR data in some of these cases, how is that analyzed? Is that gonna be able to give you the form of data that's gonna answer the question that you're working on. 
In this next slide, you can see some of the outputs of the landscape resilience assessment. On the left-hand side, you have eco objects, funny word, but eco objects, eco objects, whatever you want to call it. That is derived from that LIDAR data where you take this comprehensive data and you segment it based on tree approximate objects, that's a term of art, and you have a canopy height model. So what you end up with, you can see the top is where all the original data is, on the bottom are the eek objects. You can see those faint blue outlines. So that takes an individual tree or a clump of trees or an opening in the forest and gives you these eek objects that map the entire landscape. There's several million eek objects just in that 60,000 acre west shore boundary of the project. What you end up then being able to do is to do these analysis to figure out what would indicate resilience in terms of water quality. This is the first example here. You can see that in some cases there's an absolute value based on peer reviewed published literature. In other cases, it's a proportional value. So how much of the landscape is in a particular condition that again is derived from some of the peer reviewed literature. That was a big part of the process. So we went through a whole range of things, fire return interval, meadow refugia, climatic water deficit comes up a bit later in the process in the presentation, human access, aquatic organism passage, floodplain condition, a whole range of things that went here. And on the next slide you can see, well some of these you can see uh, some of the other examples. On the next slide, sorry that was went ahead too. No, actually it's right. Okay, so on the far right hand side, what I wanted to call out is we also have then not simply individual indicators, but composite indicators. So if we think about a range of individual pieces around meadow or floodplains or water quality, well, what does that really tell us when we care about resilience to a particular disturbance, in this case, flooding? And so that's where we had to develop these indices where you put multiple indicators together to really give you a more robust complete picture of resilience to flooding as a disturbance. So that's what you see in that right hand side is a composite indicator. Moving on then to the landscape restoration strategy, what was so exciting here is the modeling capacity with software called Landis 2 or a model called Landis 2, which let us look at the long-term trajectory of that landscape out over 100 years for the entire landscape, not just a particular polygon or a particular small project, but the entire landscape. It let us put together fire, as you can see in the black box there, fire plus vegetation plus insects to really get a sense of how that forest is a dynamic system over time. We also had a series of smaller scale, finer resolution models for different components that we we're investigating. You see the water quantity piece there, looked at what time snow does or does not melt from the landscape. We had a water quality piece, particularly looking around roads, road-based erosion, which is really important, again, for the famous clarity here in Tahoe. We had different analyses and a bit of modeling for wildlife habitat, American Martin, California spotted owl, some other threatened and endangered species or threatened and sensitive species. On the left-hand side, smoke emissions and dispersal, the blue sky model, looking at how plumes from wildfire or prescribed burning would carry over to some of our neighboring jurisdictions municipalities or even cities like Reno, Nevada. Then we also had economics, which was a key piece. We wanted to be able to say not just in the abstract, hey, this would be nice, but really how much would this cost? How much does this compare with business as usual? And then we put some of this together through a decision support tool called the Ecosystem Management Decision Support, EMDS. Just so I don't skip over it, there were four modeling scenarios. We looked at the global climate change models, the 4.5 and 8.5 regional concentration pathways. From that, we actually worked on four different scenarios. I'm not gonna read through all this, but you had one piece which was purely fire suppression. Then you had another piece for people that work in forests. We focused on the wildland urban interface, basically where a lot of communities and houses and structures exist. That's pretty much what, how we operate today. The third one had more extensive thinning going also into the general forest to change fire behavior before it even arrives at the wildland urban interface. And then the fourth one had a lot more prescribed burning trying to get closer towards that historical fire regime that shaped the Sierra Nevada. This was a key piece of trying to think a bit adaptively going out to the future in light of those global climate change models.
Oops. So this is an example of the outputs. Don't worry. Again, I know they're tiny pieces. These are just meant to be illustrative, not actually to walk you through. But you can see now how some of that very fine points, those eek objects can play out. What we could do for modeling for seral stage, so kind of the, the size and age classes of the trees. Below that, you can see wildlife species richness for, for particular species of concerns. You have some high severity burning in the middle. Below that, you have um, fire, expected fire increases, you have air quality on the upper right, you have property at risk. So playing through these different modeling exercises and that linked modeling to get these different types of outputs. Then going to the strategy itself and the write-up to try and pull all this together and make sense of it. There's several functional roles that this strategy provided. <clears throat> First piece just being that framework for how we think about multiple benefits. The second one, I'll come back to in a, a moment, a bit of a deeper dive, the goals and strategies and quantified objectives. The third one, a pretty important piece, management approaches, really trying to emphasize the practitioner aspect and the land manager aspect. If you work with the Forest Service or Parks or Conservancy, what do you actually do? So there's not a lot of information in this, in this presentation, but there's a series of prioritization guidelines so you can figure out where and to focus your efforts based on geography, topography, other ecological conditions. There's also guidance for preparing a joint environmental decision. We have National Environmental Policy Act and California Environmental Quality Act, and also in the Tahoe Basin, the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency Review. So quite stringent standards for environmental decisions. There are also implementation guidelines because we have a lot of existing projects. So how do we integrate those? And also a cost estimate. I think I have a little picture of that in a moment, which I'll come back to at the end. A little bit of a deeper dive on the goals. These go out 50 to 100 years. I'm again not going to read through all these, but I just wanted to give you, sorry, just wanted to give you an example of some of the objectives for that first goal. So the first one being that forests recover from fire, drought, and insect and disease outbreaks. So you can see again some of those quantified elements again because we were lucky, we were data rich and could do this analysis, can do this modeling. So whether it's for tree density or seral stages, forest openings, you know, clumps, gaps, and openings is a common concept. Um, a special focus on aspen and riparian hardwoods in Lake Tahoe Basin, really critical again, tied to water quality. And then also if there are fire disturbances, how do we think about reforestation as openings? So again, the emphasis here, I'm not trying to walk you through the technical aspects of this, just kind of share the concepts of how we moved from goals and objectives. And then you see here the implementation strategies. There really were six that organized seven, sorry, that organized the whole document. Actually, I guess it's eight because I combined one. <clears throat> Point being, we had a series of overarching implementation strategies with some of those bolded words. You can see again what the emphasis was. Big push on forest thinning and prescribed fire. Then you have a series of meadows, invasive species, streams, number three, the economy. Again, we're not forgetting about the communities. The tribal cultural landscape aspects, number five, multi-jurisdictional approaches, really how do we do this work, number six. And then again, the water quality, lake clarity components is a big component of managing roads and trails. And on the right-hand side, it's again, very small, but just meant to illustrate the concept. We really went through and did the cost estimate for the different components of work that would carry out. Altogether, it's about $128 million worth of work over 20 years. Let me just grab a little bit of water. So, whoops, keep doing that twice. <clears throat> Moving on, if the full strategy is then implemented over 20 years, here are some of the outcomes. Again, not gonna read you through a ton of text, but just wanna illustrate really what we'd expect to happen. Not just the outputs, how many acres do we treat or what does the meadow look like, but what does that actually mean for the things we care about and that our stakeholders care about here in the Lake Tahoe Basin. So you have high severity fire, property loss, smoke impacts, old forest and those associated species, native fish, plant diversity, a whole range of components. And then of course, carbon sequestration, thinking about climate mitigation, a huge emphasis here in California. So that was the longest portion. That was the Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership. The rest of the sections are a little bit shorter. I want to now go to the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative and walk you through that. That project also started in 2016. 
it was using the Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership as a model and foundation for its work, really trying to replicate that landscape resilience assessment and landscape restoration strategy, except at a much broader scale, which I'll explain. So here we go. You can see again the pinpoint projects. Great work, longstanding, typical approach to planning restoration in the Lake Tahoe Basin. Moving from that to the landscape scale, in this case, 60,000 acres, not a particularly large landscape by some of the national programs. And you can determine or define landscape how you like. But anyway, um, a landscape. And then you can see on the far right hand side with the region, you can probably, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I won't bother, but you can see the Lake Tahoe Basin on the far right of that regional map, and you can see shaded in the rough, you know, bluish, grayish, uh, the striped lines is Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership. So this is in principle what we're moving towards, really shifting scales on this. Where the project originated was with the question, what can we do together that we can't do alone? I mean, what do we need to address again at a larger scale of some of the ecological processes that shape the Sierra Nevada that you can't get to from 60,000 acres <clears throat> or 150,000 acres or whatever it might be. So there were a couple of things that started us and I should say, I'll, I'll explain a bit more in a moment, but there are three national forests within that landscape. So that's why the emphasis is on national forests and they own the vast majority of that land. So there are a couple of things that really became possible when we scaled up from the landscape to the region. One was this ability to do large scale prescribed fire, not 20 acre burn, 200 acre burn, but a 2000 acre burn, or in some of the Southern portion around Capels Lake, a uh, 10,000 acre burn. So this opportunity to really use prescribed fire at a larger scale, <clears throat> including when it goes across jurisdictions. Another piece came out of a settlement agreement, litigation settlement agreement, the ability to use what's called wildland fires or natural ignitions. So the ability to manage those for resource values and benefits versus automatically going to fire suppression when a lightning strikes uh, occurs in some of these areas, whether it's a wilderness area or in some cases also other managed areas where it doesn't present a threat to communities, homes, infrastructure. So that ability, again, to burn across some of these larger terrains by managing natural fire ignitions. Another piece, if you look at subpopulations of sensitive wildlife, I mentioned California spotted owl, which is what you see here in the photo. That ability, if you look at the subpopulation, you can't really do population biology at such a small scale. You need to be looking at a larger approach. There was a whole demographic study that was completed, I guess it was four years ago now, <clears throat> for recovery and management of California spotted owl. The fourth piece I mentioned very early on in that forest landscape management cycle, this idea of building a pipeline of projects. So you have this large longer term supply of timber and small diameter restoration byproducts that go back to that industry that's coupled with forests. And then the fifth one is an interesting one. It's pretty exciting. We have some of these large scale trails that come down the Pacific Crest Trail from Canada to Mexico. We also have the Tahoe Rim Trail and then there's a series of others. John Muir Trail also tracks large portions of the Sierra Nevada. So this idea of being able to better manage visitation and numbers, they're increasing, uh, not necessarily linearly every year, but over time, the trend has been only up and up for people to get outside in California. And we see that even more with COVID this year. So these large scale uh, hiking opportunities, recreational opportunities. The right-hand map, by the way, I know it's small, but it just shows a little bit. You can see the Lake Tahoe Basin with a little green tree that shows you some of the distances to some of these uh, forest product facilities, whether it's a mill or producing other types of products, wood pellets or other types of components. Okay, where is my cursor? Okay. So this I mentioned briefly, I won't read through them all, but in terms of who pulled this larger Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative together, you have the Forest Service. A key piece is number four there. It's not just the Tahoe and the El Dorado National Forest and the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit, but we work really closely both in that Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership and also in Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative with the Pacific Southwest Research Station, which covers region five of the Forest Service, which is the Pacific Southwest region. Then you can see there are actually two state conservancies, California Tahoe Basin, which we have a pretty small geography for the jewel of California, jewel of the Sierra Nevada, which is Lake Tahoe, Sierra Nevada, which is Lake Tahoe itself. 
And then also the Sierra Nevada Conservancy itself, which has an enormous jurisdiction, really stretches up from Modoc all the way down to Kern County. And then, like I mentioned, several key partners, two nonprofits, um, two other state, uh, one other state agency, Cal Fire, and then another uh, third nonprofit. So trying not to read all the names. Wanted to emphasize this a little bit here, <clears throat> excuse me, of what I showed a little bit earlier, but it didn't have names or kind of geographies really associated too well with that in the earlier map. But part of the opportunity in the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative was you don't need to start and rebuild some giant mega stakeholder collaborative with 200 members trying to meet monthly or whatever it is. You have this series of eight existing forest landscape collaboratives. Like I mentioned, there's that trend. It's becoming quite popular and well appreciated within California. So you can see here, there are a couple, I won't read all the names, but South Fork of the American River, the cohesive strategy, uh, that's part of their planning initiative and a series of other ones that go through. So that was a big part of this opportunity. The three national forests and the two conservancies are already on board with these types of stakeholder driven landscape scale collaborative efforts. A real opportunity there again, not to redo it all, but how do we put this network into motion? So where we are wrapping up a lot of this stuff actually just now in the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative, this stuff is not final, but what we worked on was a series of desired landscape outcomes. In some cases they're called pillars too, but the idea really there is what do you want that landscape to look like when you're done? And you can see in the center of this diagram, it's also around the outside of this diagram, you see these 10 different kind of values, air quality, water security, wetland integrity, on through the forests and carbon and communities and economy. So you see these types of desired landscape outcomes. For each of these, we spent time working with stakeholders and the executive steering committee from the agencies and the key land management staff and really developing these sentence statements that characterize, okay, how, how do you express, how do you say what that outcome looks like on the ground if you're gonna be successful in your restoration effort? So you can see, um, again, this isn't final, final, and there's a little bit of uh, language removed just to kind of fit it on. I couldn't uh, get it all here anyway, but you can see those statements about the desired outcomes. And then what's exciting going a bit further is trying to get some consistency in how we roll this out across the 2.4 million acres without being overly prescriptive. So you can see for each of those desired landscape outcomes, say for example, economic diversity, there's a series of key elements. Again, this was all negotiated, worked on uh, over quite a, quite a while with stakeholders and agencies, the wood products industry, recreation industry, water industry, economic health. And then for each of those, you typically have two or three, sometimes just one, sometimes four, but the two or three kinds of core metrics, the types of things that give you the most kind of leverage or insight into a particular element if you're trying to measure that. A lot of times trying to find metrics or that are a little bit divergent you know they're not overlapping so much that there's not a big point in measuring them we're trying to find ones that have enough difference they really tell you a little bit something different about the story key piece about this by the way was what i mentioned a minute ago we were trying to avoid being prescriptive we recognize that even if you take a metric like say smoke induced illness the data sets that a given forest will have or a given land area, whether it's a county or whatever it might be, or state lands will have for that particular metric may certainly vary with the actual forest or the landowner. So in some cases, you might again have LIDAR, light detection and ranging type data. In other cases, you might only have field data and plot data from actually going out there and looking at the landscape. So we are trying to give people enough of a common base through these metrics to help everybody have somewhat similar assessments, somewhat similar reporting, somewhat similar objectives without being prescriptive and saying, oh, well, you need this particular data set with that particular type of analysis. Just doesn't, doesn't exist. Too much diversity among the data that's actually out there. <clears throat> So then looking at some of these assessment products, excuse me, <clears throat> some of these assessment products that are coming out of Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative, one second. Some of these assessment products that are coming out of the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative, Sierra Initiative look pretty similar to what you saw in Lake Tahoe West pieces, forest resilience, water security, biodiversity conservation for a range of different species that are in there, some of these 
individual indicators, some of these composite indicators like water security. One thing I should say, by the way, that was a little bit different between Lake Tahoe West and Tahoe Central Sierra was that their landscape resilience assessment in Tahoe Central Sierra covers current and future conditions. I'm going to come back to future conditions in a moment. And they have the modeling actually part of the assessment. That's probably too far in the weeds. I just want to acknowledge that there is a little bit of difference in how the processes were structured. Where we're turning the corner, we're actually cleaning up. Oh, this is another one. So I should, sorry, I should have said this. Another example of some of the outcomes for current conditions, the economic diversity. And then you can see some of those composites, water security, fire resilience, uh, protected human communities, and how those kind of rank across on the far hand right side. Where we're going next and kind of turning the corner, there's been a lot of conceptual development, but not a lot of content yet is the equivalent of a landscape resilience strategy or landscape restoration strategy for the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative. It's called a blueprint uh, in that case. And there's a lot of emphasis here since, since the assessment has the modeling bit different again from Lake Tahoe West. Here really we're focused on practitioner tools and using a decision support tool. Some people are probably familiar with. It's popular among the forest service called ecosystem management decision support. So a couple of pieces there, it helps you use logic models to synthesize a large amount of data and evaluate your management options and trade-offs for different actions at different scales. It then can help you prioritize where you should do the work, where should you focus first. And then as some of the outputs will be these spatial explicit maps that help you understand what the potential is and where it should go. The last piece here, I know I got about 10 minutes left to wrap up. Um, so last slide on this section is just thinking about a bit more what might come next for the Sierra Nevada. You can see here in this map, this is from the Sierra Nevada strategic investment plan process. It's not complete. It's kind of had a little bit of fits and starts, but that blue centerpiece, you can see that's the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative. And the idea was to roll this out through a series of other large regions that cover the entire Sierra Nevada mountain range. Another parallel effort where some of this may play out, the recommendations are actually probably coming out I'm guessing in December is the Governor Newsom has a forest management task force and they're developing some of these regional approaches to forest planning and restoration as well. So wrapping up here, this is the fourth and final part of the presentation, looking at some of these system transformations on the horizon. The reason why I say it's on the horizon is it's not like we're in the throes of these things yet, although I guess I, I could argue against myself with this year of wildfires in California, but these are things that you can see. They're not just, oh, this may happen someday out in the future. It's advancing, it's happening, it's occurring. We're seeing the beginnings of some of these processes. It's already here and starting. So what I'm gonna do in this, this last section is pretty short, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of examples of transformations in Tahoe. And I'm gonna talk a little bit for a moment just about the larger Sierra Nevada region with regard to flooding. And then I'm gonna end coming back to Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative with water and fire and insects and vegetation. One piece I need to share before going into that is just the conceptual foundation. I mentioned resilience earlier talking about capacity to withstand disturbances while still learning and adapting. Another concept that uh, fits like a glove with this it's part of the same uh, series of scholarly literature and scholarly theory is the adaptive cycle. You start in the bottom left where you're establishing some kind of system, expanding, exploiting resources, growing pretty rapidly. You move to the upper right where you're conserving resources. You have some kind of organization, some kind of structure, some kind of efficiency. Eventually you reach some kind of crisis or threshold and you move through a series of release and dispersal of energy. There's some kind of collapse, whatever it might be. And then you start coming back around in the figure eight or the infinity loop with the reorganization. So making sense of what's happening, where do we need to go? What are we searching for? How do we begin to build a foundation for some kind of new system? And then on the right hand side is the concept of panarchy, which is takes that adaptive cycle and just really wants to emphasize how there, there are different scales at which these, these processes play out, whether you're working in a single project or whether you're working throughout the whole state of California or some of you working internationally across the entire globe. So thinking about how these changes and in information are flowing and in communication <clears throat> across different scales upward and downward, um, some things might happen, you know, there are changes caused at a higher level or changes caused at a lower level as we go forward. 
And then the last concept was transformation, which I haven't really said much about uh, at this point, but it's this idea of creating a fundamentally new system when there are social structures and processes, the, 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 the ecology of a place, the economy of a place, what's happening in society, make that existing system untenable. And so in this case, when we're looking at force in California, the same landscapes we know we might have grown up on or recreated on, they take on a new structure, new processes, new identity, and those contributions that they provide to people shift also. Glimpses of this in Taha, I'll keep this light. It's not, not really the focus of this, but everything I mentioned is about clarity in Taha. We're getting shorter and warmer winters which means that the historical mixing that occurs during the lake and promotes clarity, brings sediment to the bottom, is slowing down. You're getting stratification. So if you look at some of the modeling and some of the studies by the end of the century, or depending exactly when it happens, how fast, in the worst case scenarios, the famous blue of Tahoe could turn to green, just like so many other lakes throughout the Sierra Nevada which weren't blue to begin with, but you can lose that famous clarity. And a similar component on the right-hand side, looking at the loss of the ski industry. So that's obviously what a lot of people come to in Tahoe. In that dark purple, that's where you'll get rain almost certainly. In that light purple, rain is more likely than snow by the end of the century. And that those little remnants of white are where you would still have snow above 9,000 feet by the end of the century. The irony or the, the thing that gets everyone so nervous is if you look at those little black blobs, those are where the current ski industries are that have snow today. So you're left with these little fractions. So these are the types of transformations, losing clarity, loss of the ski industry that we're starting to talk about and anticipate in Tahoe. If you go to the rest of the Sierra Nevada, I know I got five minutes left here to wrap up. I think we'll hit it. If you go to the rest of the Sierra Nevada, I'm gonna talk about flooding for a little bit. It's uncertain what's really gonna happen with total precipitation. There's about 10% variation by the end of the century based on current modeling, but it is clear and certain that the, in the extremes, the extreme events will increase as we go towards the end of the century. If you look on the right-hand side, you can see under scenario RCP 4.5, regional concentration pathway 4.5, about 10 to 15% larger storms, larger, large storms. Sorry, let me slow down. And then on the 8.5, it's 20 to 25% larger, large storms. Why this matters, if you look at a couple of years ago, the winter of 2016, 17, we had very large storms, they're called atmospheric rivers. A whole series of them came through California and broke a six year drought. The amount of damage that happens out on these forests to infrastructure, roads, recreational facilities, campgrounds, trails, all these places. This is just a map of Tahoe National Forest within, that's within the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative. This is a map of the damages that they had and how extensive they were after that storm season. On the forest to the south, the El Dorado National Forest, it was about $25 million worth of damages. That's from one season. That might be, you know, uh, the majority of work that you can do. So you're just constantly moving towards this deficit with these types of flooding impacts. Coming back to land Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative and wrap up here, there's been a series of large wildfires. You can see uh, the biggest blob there is the King Fire I mentioned earlier, and then you can see Lake Tahoe. Whoops. In the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative, they actually did six scenarios. It's not critical for me to go through these. Again, I'm not trying to explain all that stuff, but they did six different modeling scenarios. And here are the findings, key findings. I'm just gonna focus on these first two. There are a couple more on the next page. But what we're looking at over the next 20 years, major declines in biomass, a change in forest composition, and a switch in the landscape from sequestering carbon to being a source of carbon. So these are the transformations on the horizon that we're looking for. And that second one, why I bolded and put it in italics, management is competing with disturbances for harvestable material. So our ability to actually use the forest to have nature's contributions to people is being outpaced by some of these disturbances. Where is this coming from? Well, if you look at some of these factors like climatic water deficit, it's basically a measure of how much the soil lacks water. You can see the deficit increasing out to 2100. And concurrently, you can see the amount of biomass that's being killed by insects and disease. There's a lot that's gonna be dying in the next several years. And by the end of the century, you don't just have that much to continue killing through insects and disease. 
An example of this, you may have seen news stories over the past several years, how this plays out is the concept of tree mortality throughout the Sierra Nevada. We had a six year drought, particularly deep between 2014 and 2017. Insect outbreaks were tracking with that and got worse towards the end. You can see there on the right hand side, the dead trees per square mile, about 160 million trees across the state with older trees being most vulnerable. That water to insects and tree mortality plays out then how you look at the community cumulative area that gets burned each year. It's the gray line. I know these are all small figures, but it's the gray line that basically just goes up. And as you burn the forests, as you lose that material, your carbon sequestration rates go down. So the last, I think I got the last two slides here. Yeah, last two slides here. So what we end up is the type conversion or a transformation of what forest we see out there. That bottom row first is the biomass. So you can see going from, you know, whatever mid-level of biomass down to low levels of biomass. Again, as you're burning so much of that material and it's coming off of land. And on the top side where you can see the forest types are transforming, you're losing a lot of red and white fir. The mixed conifer is moving up elevation you're getting more single species forest with Jeffrey and Ponderosa pine. And it's not shown on this map because it's not part of the analysis area, but at the lower elevation, you're losing oak woodlands. So where do we go from here? Uh, these changes are happening statewide. For anybody that uh, read the news um, or saw the news on fire, unprecedented fire season in California this year, beginning in August with a series of a lightning event, 3000 lightning strikes, about a quarter of that on national forest lands. Each year we found since the 1980s or so, the fire season is, is starting earlier and it's lasting longer. It's increased by about 75 days. So two and a half months more every year we're out there trying to fight fire in California. 9,000 some fires this year in California, 4.2 million acres burned, 10,000 structures, 31 fatalities. And that's just forests in California. We're not talking agriculture, we're not talking sea level rise in our coastal cities. We're not talking about chaparral forests in Southern California. Really, a lot of this comes down to developing more fluency with that forest landscape management cycle to try and get us to bigger pace and scale and to shift from reacting to these changes to trying to get ahead of them or at least steer or navigate them with the least disruption to our ecologies and to our communities. We're trying to get some more of that integrated work done, the forests and the watersheds and the communities all together and change our relationship with the landscape. So thank you for listening. That's my last slide. I'll stop there. Happy, I'll turn it back over. I'm gonna stop sharing. I'll turn it over to Kara and Brock and we'll do some Q&A. Thanks so much, Dorian. Really appreciate your very clear presentation. And also as said in the chat by Clive, uh, Clive Benhura, thank you for looking after this beautiful and ecologically important area for future generations. And I think your presentation really highlighted the complexity of managing fire adapted forests. There were also some comments in the chat uh, about how it was really interesting to see fire being used as a management tool. I also want to thank all of our participants for joining and listening and also for using the chat for networking, which is a big goal for this series. So thank you to those who introduced yourselves. It's not too late to do so. Feel free to share resources from your lab, your organizations. I tried to model that, so I was busy sharing during the chat. Um, and we have about 10 minutes, 12 minutes actually to the hour. Dorian has agreed that he could stick around a little past the hour if we still wanna follow up with additional questions. So you can feel free to keep adding questions into the Q&A window. Please don't post them in the chat or I'll miss them. So Dorian, there were several questions that were about uh, degradation and restoration goals in the system. And so Shanmuga asked, why should insects be controlled? Aren't they part of biodiversity? Okay, I'll follow your lead, Kara. I'll, I'll respond to this one. <clears throat> Definitely agree. That is part of, that is one of those disturbance processes that we had in the landscape resilience framework that is a natural occurrence, is totally part of the system. And I agree with Shanmuga, like that, that has shaped the system historically over time. 
I think the challenge here is the this, this scale and intensity and frequency now that that disturbance is occurring. Um, so it's, it's trying to get us back towards something where it won't totally denude or depopulate the landscape and you lose the entire forest. That was one of the pictures that I showed towards the end. You know, some of these areas are 30, 40% of the landscape now has no trees. So it's less, I think to Sean Mugo's point, hey, good or bad, it's just not that simple. It's just, how do we think about a dynamic system where it's not overwhelming and shifting it us towards that transformation where we lose the mixed conifer forest entirely. Great, thank you. There was a series of questions about the ecological metrics. I'm gonna start with Linda's. Um, she asked, what ecological units were used to understand, control, and define the ecosystem response and resilience? This is important to the strategy. I'm thinking about land type associations, for example. And, and then I'll just, I guess I'll go on. She adds watersheds could be appropriate for certain water quality, water quantity indicators, but not for other metrics. Yeah, some of this I'll freely admit is beyond my technical expertise. I'm a political ecologist by training, not a, not a biologist. Um, so it's, it's it, I would have, we'd have to go and actually look at some of those materials. Each of these has a, um, you know, kind of a scientific framework and a technical report that goes through it. Um, some of the pieces, I don't know if I can pull this up quickly enough, but some of the pieces that we looked at, let's see if I can get it on my end. Um, some of the pieces that we looked at, so for example, for meadows and marshes were the mean condition class, fire severity, road and trail linkages, the amount of human access, floodplain condition, existence of refugia. So there's a whole series of those. Not sure if that's exactly answering the question, but um, the point uh, is that, you know, in these collaborative processes, we'd have the hydrologists, we'd have the botanists, we'd have the silviculturists, we'd have the fire management specialists, we'd have the cultural resources person or the tribe themselves. And so that, to the, to the point of the question, was a lot of the part of the deliberation and the hard work. We couldn't just get the cookie cutter template and say, oh, this is so easy. We have all these pieces. The other part that was hard about that, and that was really a conceptual shift for people, was not just an indicator of kind of health as an amorphous context or amorphous concept, but an indicator of resilience. So again, going back to that capacity to withstand and respond to a disturbance. So it's not just what's an indicator of flooding, whether it's you know quantity or frequency or intensity of a flood, but what's going to give you an indicator of that resilience to flooding. So that was a big part of it. Um, totally agree with the point that, you know, the way you set up your assessment is going to unavoidably circumscribe your results and limit your results and give you a framing. So that, again, was a deliberative uh, process. Um, I forget if this person's name was Connie or something, but if you would uh, like some more of that technical documentation, feel free to email me. I can put my email in the chat or, or through the webinar series with, with Brock and Kara and can point you to some of that technical uh, references for some of these pieces. I didn't try and pepper the presentation with you know, all these links. Um, and then I think I heard a little bit about the water quality uh, quantity indicators component. I mean, the only thing I'll say about that, I'm not sure if I got exactly the question, but yes, I, again, that's part of the challenge in the process is that's why we had to spend the time getting clear resilience of what to what for whom, because that also is going to shape so much of what you care about. I mean, it, you know, if, if you're, Anyway, it just shapes so much of that. And so here in the Tahoe Basin, again, the clarity component is a, is a cardinal principle. Not sure how well that answered it, but hopefully that was at least a start, Kara. That, that was great. And I did post a link to the um, initiative. And so there may be documents that you can follow up there for more specific details. So we have had a series of questions about um, stakeholder engagement, community engagement, and specifically indigenous knowledge and traditional communities. And you mentioned um, integration with the tribe, but could you provide more detail on that? Yes, and if I can find it, I'm actually gonna pull up um, the uh, cultural indicators. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, California, United States has a, 
a horrendous history of genocide um, with tribes and California was some of the some of the worst. Um, you know, the federal agencies in California have had trust obligations. There's a whole obviously larger history of paternalism and fiduciary responsibility and, and those components. With, without going into that, I will say that um, the Washoe tribe of Nevada and California is a federally recognized tribe. And since the 1970s and particularly the 1980s, there's been a trend towards more tribal engagement uh, with federally recognized tribes in California and also in the past 15, 20 years, non-federally recognized tribes in California. So my agency, the California Tahoe Conservancy, we're a state agency. We didn't have the same federal requirements for consultation, but since I think it's 2012, we've had a memorandum of understanding with the tribe. So when we did the initial stakeholder assessment, we interviewed the tribal chairman and several tribal, tribal elders and uh, tribal uh, board members um, council member, sorry. And uh, then through that process, continued to work with the tribes. Sometimes they could make the meetings. We provided a travel stipend for all the stakeholders. Um, we did a field visit out to the West Shore to Meeks Meadow, which is a tribally, tribally significant landscape or component of the landscape. The whole area was traditional Washoe territory and have pushed to develop these, these cultural indicators that took a bit of time and, and not all of them lend themselves obviously to quantification in the same way, but we looked at acres of meadows, we looked at culturally important native plant cultivation, culturally important native fish species, um, number of culturally important sites protected. And I guess we're all end care of what was, I think particularly exciting about that, which we tried to get at was this idea of associations with a place. So not just, well, hey, it's my plant for basket making, but I used to live here and I can't tell you or articulate the, you know, the feeling in my body when I'm out there. And so there are parts of the basin like that, like Cave Rock is a, is a, a famous place and um, Skunk Harbor and some of these other landscapes, Meeks Meadow I mentioned. So we're also trying to get at how do you build that association? So how many days are youth out working on the land, hands on the land program? So that was also a rich piece which went beyond just kind of cultural resources to associations with the place. And that engagement continues. The tribe has continued to participate in the process. If the meetings don't work, we go to them. We go down to the tribal office in Gardnerville and brief them at minimum twice a year. There's a whole bunch of overlapping work we do. Great, thank you. And um, we're almost at the hour here. So some of you I'm expecting will need to drop off. Um, I'm just gonna queue up the next topics in case uh, it piques your interest to stay on a couple extra minutes. We have some questions also continuing on stakeholders about communities. Um, and then someone asked what a political ecologist does. And so I'll ask you to just explain a little bit more about your field. So let's start with these um, uh, questions about the community. And there's two, Robin asks, what are the projections regarding livelihoods within the Central Sierra region? How will the transformations affect the local population? And I'm just going to ask the next one because I, I think it's interesting in concert. What about community role in forest restoration and climate resilience, as I think it depends on community awareness and responsibility? Yeah, those are great, great questions. Um, briefly on the, you know, <clears throat> projections. Excuse me one second. projections regarding livelihoods. It's a really interesting question with kind of a several decades long trajectory. There was a lot of protest and civil unrest and, and very high conflict within California and throughout the whole Pacific Northwest in growing more and more in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, again, around threatened and endangered species, not just owls, but fisher, martin, frogs, amphibians, um, you know, sensitive plants, a whole range of pieces. So a lot of, the, and then also around the forest practices, shifting away from clear cutting. So a lot of those forest communities that had a timber industry and were built as timber communities have had a really difficult time because the, the base of industry and hence population, taxation, schools, school lunches, they're all connected. And so part of the, the hope here is that can we build a quote unquote restoration economy? where, okay, it might not be clear cutting, but if you have these 
very dense forests that are, are a result of fire suppression, which I didn't go into and I won't go into here, but, and you, but you're doing restoration of resilience, don't you have the opportunity for building these byproduct industries and in some cases timber programs as well, where you're doing ecological restoration of the forest at the same time. That's certainly the hope for jobs and employment. That's a big push of the federal programs and also some of the restoration projects we do here in California. The other aspect of that I'll say briefly is the recreation industry. It's amazing. I believe in the Sierra Nevada, it surpassed the amount of timber receipts and timber revenues, partly because of the decline of those industries in the late 1990s. In the Tahoe Basin, for example, I think it's about a $6 billion recreation economy. We have 24 million visitors a year, which is more than any national park. It's I think 14 million is Golden Gate. But anyway, the point is um, the recreation economy is there. So, so that piece around transformation and local responsibility and awareness, it's huge. The role of small businesses here are directly going to be affected and impacted by all these types of changes. We've had started to have more focus on that with some of our climate work focus climate work here in Tahoe. And I agree the awareness and responsibility, this can't be led by some external people. This has to be the people that live and breathe and recreate and work and play and raise their families on the landscape, being part of that dialogue, being part of those actions. Great, thank you. How about um, this question about, uh, can you explain more about what a political ecologist does? And this is Caitlin asking. Sure. Uh, I will say that um, political ecology, it's a, it's a field of scholarly endeavor. I think it has a strong activist bent. It came kind of emerged in 1970s, 1980s as a response to some of the more deterministic or reduction framings of environmental problems, which goes back a lot to Garrett Hardin, you know, Tragedy of the Commons, which is actually an open access resource, not a commons um, in his examples. Some of those uh, Framings, also just population pressure automatically equals pressure on resources. So it's a critique and a refutation of some of these ideas that had very simple analyses of environmental degradation and started to look much more at power relationships, much more at access to resources, control of resources. The two kind of two fields that it emerged from were geography, where there's really an emphasis on political economy. How do we think about connections between power and wealth and access to resources? So a lot from geography and then also from anthropology, the whole field around cultural practices. How do, how do people think about the landscape and their connections and live within the landscape? How does that tie to migration, entrepreneurialism, religion? There's so much that goes into how people live with the landscape and political ecology was a fusion of these two with no matter where you're working, a healthy dose of the actual ecology, particularly in some of those early studies around, around land degradation and society, that continues to be the focus going forward. For me, that's what my training was as a PhD was in that field. I don't work in academia anymore, but that framing of looking at the relationships between power and wealth and culture and nature continues to be the basis of what I do when I think about a stakeholder process. Where is the tribe? Who owns the land? What's the industry connected to this? What other people are out there? It's just, you, you can't separate again the people from nature. So I would say, you know, politically ecologists are largely working within a university or academic setting, but that framework and critique, there are plenty of people that take that into professional work, into advocacy work, into legal work, whatever it might be. So the, the kind of theory and concepts, you know, continue to be developed in academia, but applied in a whole variety of professional practices as that frame for understanding society's relationship with nature. Great, thank you for explaining that. Um, I was remiss in not reminding folks that our next presentation is December 18th, Friday, December 18th. So we hope we'll see many of you joining us next month, wrapping up the year, and then we'll have a new calendar for all of 2021 uh, available um, just probably shortly after the new year. And um, I, Dorian's email was put in the chat. Dorian, you said folks could email you, so we shared that. And we also um, will send Dorian the full chat, uh, everything that was in the chat, as well as all the questions. So you can feel free to follow up. We, I want to end with one more topic that we haven't had a chance to get to. And I think it's really interesting. Dorian, I don't know um, 
how much you have been involved in this, but for many restoration projects and forests around the globe, the challenge is really um, native plant materials and where you get those materials from. Interestingly, in the Western US, it's not so much planting as removing, um, but still there is a need for understory plant materials, et cetera. So here's the question. Being lost or forests need to be replanted after fire. How are the trees and herbaceous species propagated at scale? Who is propagating the plant material for these efforts? Do you collect seeds or cuttings that contain local genetic diversity? Why or why not? So yes, another uh, enormously rich uh, topic here. I'll just say, uh, I'll, I'll answer this at a general uh, general level. Um, most of my work, before I worked for this state agency, I spent about a decade or so as a public policy mediator, did a lot of work with the, the Forest Service Region 5, Pacific Southwest that I mentioned. Um, in a lot of cases, after you get fire, particularly high severity fire over large patches where you get quote unquote moonscapes, Things like the Rim Fire, if anyone remembers that from 2013, that was that blew everything away at the time in California where you had over 100,000 acre burn. This year we had over a million acre burn back in August. But anyway, in those cases, there are raging debates around reforestation because depending how you do it, you end up having, there's been published studies about plantations burning at a higher rate and more regularly than what you would have as kind of a man, um, natural forest with clumps, gaps in the forest, um, and individual trees. And so there is a large debate around that. Most reforestation that I'm aware of is actually considered a project by the, the Federal Forest Service. So they go out and do that. I don't know enough specifically about um, how they collect the seeds, but I know here in the Lake Tahoe Basin, we have a grant with University of California Davis that we provided the grant, we do a lot of grant making, provided a grant to the University of California at Davis where they're actually looking at the genetic diversity and the adaptive capacity of sugar pine, which is a favorite famous tree in the Lake Tahoe Basin and throughout the Sierra Nevada. And so there is a lot of research and they partner with the Forest Service precisely to start gathering some of that information. How do we think about how climate bands will move up elevation or up latitude and what should you be planting? Again, that is enormous debate. There's nothing easy, you know, should you be, you know, uh, actually assisted migration and moving those species? Should you let a, a, a whole field about that? But fundamentally, I think the largest, uh, you know, reforestation efforts are the Federal Forest Service. And I think more and more they are, again, I, I don't have much experience. I think they, they have quite a, uh, a scientific cadre and research programs where there's probably quite a bit of work looking at genetic diversity and adaptive capacity. Uh, the last thing I'll say in terms of tribes and that component, you know, that's a really interesting piece. I mean, just here in California in September, we had a new administrative policy around uh, ancestral lands, tribal ancestral lands. So pushing for co-management, pushing to use state lands that don't have a particular need for state uses to return those to the tribes. And so I think more and more, you're gonna see some of these places where the tribes themselves are doing that work. One of the pieces I mentioned, Lake Tahoe West Meeks Meadow is actually where we're preparing to bring a grant to our board in December to help them implement a cultural burning, cultural restoration project with native plant materials. I personally don't know enough about where they're getting their own seed sources, but I know they have a hot house. I know they do a lot of work that themselves. They have a whole climate adaptation program, the Washoe tribe. So um, hard for me to say how widespread that is, but I don't think it's uncommon. Um, and I think if anything, there's more of a need to do that and have people that have that cultural knowledge, historical knowledge to actually be leading a lot of that work in partnership with you know, other, other landowners, other stakeholders. Great. Dorian, thank you so much. This was really fascinating, well-delivered presentation. We'll be posting it on the YouTube channel. It takes, I think, about a week um, to get it up there. If anyone has any questions about the Commission on Ecosystem Management's Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group, our acronym is ERTG, contact Brock or myself and we'll be happy to share information and hopefully we'll see many of you next month. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye, thanks so much.